no matter where you are in the world, we all come together to learn some chess, right? So, so great to be here. Um, hope you guys are ready to, to learn some openings. Today we'll be focusing on the Petrov defense, a very, very old favorite. Never played it, actually. I've never played it. Um, but I have prepared one of my students uh, to play it in the South African Junior Championship before. Um, she was just used to, to playing <laughs> the Petrov a lot of the time and it was just too late to change her mind because obviously I would want to convert her trying to get her to play something like the French or the Sicilian. Um, but I suppose... You know, when it's a week before the event, you don't want to drastically change your opening repertoire. Because first of all, there are those psychological points uh, that you need to focus on. Um, such as, uh, you know, will I remember all the theory? Will I be confident enough to play this over the board? Um, I guess there are certain advantages. You'll be throwing your opponent off because obviously they'll be preparing against the opening you've always played and then suddenly you're throwing a new opening at them and they're out of preparation and also just the phys uh, the normal chess aspects of things that it's very difficult to memorize variations upon variations a week before an event so you just want to stick to what you're used to streaming jinxing unsuccessful you were jinxing the stream eccentric horse Oh, I should have done this two years ago to help you against... I mean, you still won the championship, Eccentric Horse. Hi there, Elopital. Good to see you, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'd like to give a chance to everyone to just arrive so that we can start together. I hope you are fresh and ready to learn. I also try to do a little bit of research on the Petrov uh, defense um, but this is gonna be quite exciting actually so the Petrov defense is also otherwise known as the um, the Russian defense and it's something that people wanted to to use um, to try and um, kind of steer clear from uh, just give me one second there we go. Okay, steer clear <laughs> um, from dealing with the, you know, having a mic that moves around is not ideal. <laughs> uh, steer clear from the Riley Pears, the Scotch game, the Scotch Gambit. Um, I don't know. Yes, probably, probably not. King's Gambit wouldn't count because e4, e5, f4, and you're still having to deal with that. Um, but yeah, there are a number of openings that uh, that you can just kind of swerve away from by playing the Petrov. And also, I know it's gained popularity at a higher level when uh, Fabiano Caruana, and I don't think he was the first one, maybe he was, uh, who played it. At a, at a top level, at elite tournaments, where the Petrov just made a sudden appearance and gained popularity again. Can we chat a bit before we start? What would you like to chat about? Usually, the people who come to these lectures want to learn. Um, but I suppose I could still continue to greet everyone. The Stafford Gambit? I don't know so much about the Stafford Gambit, but I can tell you one thing. That name does ring a bell. That name does ring a bell. Um, but we will take a look. The first game that we'll take a look at um, is Jose Raul Capablanca, Capablanca versus Frank James Marshall. Frank James Marshall. And we'll often just take a look at, at, look at it from Black's perspective, because this is um, an opening for black, the Petrov defense, and what I really liked about this game is that the title 
in the annotations uh, was No Way Jose, and his name is Jose, so it's quite nice. Good morning, Raul. <laughs> yes, hi, Judith. How's it going? I don't know about that eccentric. That's not the one that made you famous. Alrighty. So let's begin and I'll show you exactly how the Petrov actually um, came to be. Uh, alrighty. So we have e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6 and that is what we call the Petrov. I would also like to take a look at it quickly or at least briefly um, from White's point of view. So if we say e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, I've had to deal, the, deal with this opening on numerous occasions with white pieces. And first of all, I'm going to go over the opening trap if your opponent doesn't know what they're doing. And then go through a line where your opponent does know what they're doing. And then there, there is this very odd variation that people play. And so taking and knight c6. So knight c6 throws me off a little because now white has just captured a pawn. White is up a pawn. But uh, what black tries to do here is try to be a little bit sneaky. So after captures, black will take with the d pawn, which opens the file for the queen. And often you'll find the queen and the bishop working together along this diagonal. So let's play bishop to c4, for instance, and here black would simply, I think the main move is bishop here. I might be wrong. I think bishop c5 might be slightly better. Bishop c5, or probably wanting to defend the pawn. So d3, defending e4, otherwise black will just capture it. And then bishop to c5, bishop to e2, and... Here, I think this is a move, is it not? Is it not a move? Perhaps? I still feel like there are a lot of tactical resources here for black. And to be honest with you, after this move, bishop c5, the best move in the position, believe it or not, the best move. So white is a pawn up. The best move for white is h3 is h3 stopping all tactics stopping all these fancy things from happening h3 stops it all can you believe it all right so h3 is the way to go um often i would play bishop e2 but somehow i think uh Black has some some random lines here. Knight g4. Knight g4? Okay, knight g4 can be played. I'm very confused. What do you guys think of this? What would white play in this position? Hi. Hi, everyone. e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, knight takes e5, knight c6 is the Stafford Gambit. So it actually has a name. Look at that. Shubham, what? Why are you being so rude? That's rude. Peaches. Oh my goodness. Talking about boring openings. This is this is not up to me. You don't have to be so mean. Jeez. <laughs> Something's hanging. It is, but uh, how would White deal with this? I hope you guys also brought your beverage. I have a cup of coffee with me. How to defend there? We'll see. The Stafford is Eric Rosen's favorite. That's why it's famous. Fair enough, I didn't know that. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. Good afternoon. The thing is, I would love to take the knight. This knight, is it not free? It says white is much better here. But is it not free? Ah, I see the way forward. Okay. So black would play bishop takes f2. Is this not the way? 
what is the way? Ah, immediately queen h4. Okay. Queen h4 immediately. Fair enough. Fair enough. Queen h4 threatening the bishop and f2. So maybe it still gets a little bit tricky. I can see why Eric likes it. But if you want to put Eric Rosen's line to rest after bishop c5, just play h3. And you don't have any more problems in your life. Zero problems. Queen d4 is a move. But I think after that you can just play queen f3. And it's completely winning for white. There's just nothing white can do. After g3? I don't know so much. I don't know. Quite interesting. I will. I will go check out I am Rosen's uh, uh, Stafford Gambit line. Okay, so that's quite interesting for white. Um, another way to deal with it is just to take and after d6 come back and knight takes e4. And this is the usual line played uh, with the exchange. And there are two things to do here. You could either play uh, d4, you could play c4, or you could play knight c3. Um, I personally enjoy playing c4 here. Uh, another way forward is also playing a move like knight c3. If knight takes, you could take back with the d pawn and then just focus on development king safety. Um, there is also c4, bishop e7, knight c3, knight captures, uh, d captures, castle, and here bishop to e3. What white wants to do, try to get a queenside castling in, and if something like bishop to g4, you play queen d2, maybe h6, depending on the weather. You could even do this, and if the bishop captures, you capture back with the pawn, and you're quite happy. Even though there are some structural weaknesses, two sets of double pawns, you don't want to focus too much on exchanging pieces or the weaknesses you have, but rather the compensation you have for these weaknesses, such as rook g1, trying to focus on the king. So rook g1, the idea is here, rook g1, bishop takes h6. You could also play bishop to d3, aiming towards the h7 square. Then you could retreat the bishop, put the queen on d3, and then you have checkmating ideas on h7. So there's a lot here for white to do, and the king would simply go to the queen side. If you're worried about king safety, but always get the king safe, of course, that is your first priority. So c4 is another idea. So let's go back um, to the game that we were looking at. Here, Jose, Raul, Capablanca versus Marshall, Frank James Marshall. Um, was it you who recently taught something about the Latvian gambit? It wasn't me. I didn't speak about the Latvian gambit. I didn't. Although that does sound pretty interesting. Hi, Cappy. First of... <laughs> exactly. So the song, uh, first I was afraid. I was petrified. But then I changed it. I said... First I was afraid of the Petrov knight, and that's how you remember the Petrov defense. <laughs> and good afternoon. Weaknesses are so-called only if they are attacked. Weaknesses are weaknesses, right? And then the principle of two weaknesses does not necessarily mean they're being attacked, but rather the potential of being attacked uh, it's still a weakness nonetheless. Maybe it's less of a weakness or less of a worry when that weakness is um, unobtainable or not unobtain uh, unreachable, right? For the opponent to attack. Yep. Okay. So let's continue. So knight f6, knight takes e5, d6. As we see, it's a weakness if you win. What? Okay, this is this is too deep for me. D6, knight back to f3, knight takes e4. And we have d4. And this is the line I believe eccentric horse was referring to. <laughs> the weaknesses are unexploited. Unexploitable. That is the word you are looking for. Exactly, I was just testing you to see if you were awake. Um, unexploitable. 
is definitely a word. Okay, so D4 and D5. Solidifying that advanced outpost on E4. What is the difference between an outpost and an advanced outpost? An outpost is a square on a chessboard. Okay, interesting. It's on a chessboard, usually in your opponent's territory or in the center where uh, it is backed up by a pawn, but often being able to control that square means that no other pawn can attack that square. So you can put a knight on an outpost, for instance, and uh, no no pawn will be able to come and attack it. Other pieces can, but that would still be referred to as an outpost. An advanced outpost, I might botch the de definition of an advanced outpost, but I believe it is like an outpost, although it has potential uh, to be attacked by a pawn. And here, the f2 pawn could potentially attack the knight, although in this very position, it is uh, not certain that it will. Talking about the d4 line, I was referring to e4, e5, knight of three, knight of six, immediately d4, quite tricky for beginners. Right, right, let's hope that we come across that game uh, in our analysis of, of these uh, top games as well. Free English lessons, exactly. I need the English lessons. You guys get the chess lessons, I get the English lessons. Fair enough. d5. Bishop to d3, putting pressure on the knight. Bishop to g4. So now, if the bishop def decides to take on e4, black will simply capture with the pawn, and it'll be difficult to defend the knight. The knight cannot move because of the queen that is behind the knight. I suppose h3 is a move here, but now black could simply capture. Not capture? What is the best move here? What is the best move for black in this position? What do you guys think? Play bishop g4. It was indeed played, yes. I'm cheating by using the engine. Um, so I've set uh, my screen. I've uh, zoomed in to the board to the point where I cannot see the engine. So... Uh, most of it consists of guessing. But if I go like this, I can see the engine. But you'll be able to see if I'm looking at the engine. And I just saw the engine now. E takes f3. Yes. And after taking like this. We would just take, right? Rook g1. And probably queen h4. I like queen h4. Nice. Okay, so let's go back. Losing for white. Can't do that. So after bishop g4, white decides to play castles. And just look at the immense pressure. It's only move 7. And black is putting a lot of pressure on white's position already. No way, Jose. F takes g2. Exactly. Shows up. This line is too boring. Spice it up by playing queen takes d4 instead of queen h4. What? How would that even spice it up? Okay, knight c6 and c3. I would feel a little unsure about the knight on c6 only because um, the static pawns are on the d file. What are static pawns? Pawns that are not going to be moving forward anytime soon or, to, or being contested at all here. Um, so I would much prefer to move the pawn to c6 or c5 instead of putting the knight there. But of course, it is um, all theory that Mr. Marshall, he had planned. He had planned this for months. He had been plotting. He had been plotting the death of Capablanca. The eminent chess death. So the plan, honestly, I would have played something like Knight to d7, knight to f6, just to back up the knight on e4. White went c4 instead of c3. You have a lot of questions today, eccentric horse. After c4, of course, black does not want to capture there because 
why we just capture the knight, right? So what would black do instead? What would black do instead here? Of course, we don't want to go ahead and play a move like knight takes d4. What would you play instead? Do nothing and play bishop e7. Queen e2. Ah, uh, queen e7. You don't want to block the bishop. You can play bishop e7. King b4. I was thinking knight b4. Um, but then just uh, bishop takes knight. Maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, bishop takes knight. So knight b4. Bishop takes knight. Takes. And queen e1. And I don't really know what's happening here. Oh, this is winning for black. Never mind. What does white do here? Oh, just check. Maybe not check. Not necessary. Not necessary. Hmm. Queen d2, queen b3, maybe queen b3. But again, like you're not attacking anything, so just push the pawn. Rook e1. Fair enough. And it's better for white. I don't like knight b4 too much. It felt wrong. You can always play c6, exactly. Knight b4, going to show games from black perspective, uh, pretty much today, yes. Prefer to play knight d7? Me too, me too. Okay, so the best move here uh, for black is like retreating i don't know so much about re retreating the knight to f6 so this is the best move and it's slightly better for white but white decided to play c3 here eccentric horse is making my life increasingly difficult but nonetheless i'm not complaining bishop to e7 as suggested by you guys and then knight to d2 capturing the knight because of course you don't want to lose a tempo by retreating it Bishop takes in castles. Okay, h3, bishop retreats, and rook e1. And to be honest, I would much prefer white's position here. White is a solid pawn chain, b2, c3, d4. And also the bishops are controlling the diagonals they need to control for now. The rook is on the open file. And I would feel like black's pieces could do a little better at coordinating. But let's see how... Uh, Mr. Marshall proceeds in this position. Queen to d d7. Hmm. Queen d7. I don't know about this move. Queen d7. Why does it feel like it's better for white now? Hmm. Can white play a move like knight e5? Knight e5. Or g4. Ninety five wins this. There is a beautiful game, Polga Karpov. It was a Petrov and she sacked two bishops on h7 and g7. Really? That's amazing. Retreating the knight looks like a French exchange. Fair enough. Ninety five looks good. Because after bishop captures on d1, the knight would capture on d7. The rook would have to go to d8, and here, let's take a look. Would you just capture the bishop? Maybe you play something like this? It's not that move. What would you play here? Hmm. Ooh, I like this move. Back to e5. Back to e5. And the reason for this is if bishop h5, so let's bring the bishop back. We play knight takes c6, pawn takes c6, and rook takes e7. It's quite a nice tactic. 
and if knight e5, knight takes e5, rook takes e5, and bishop retreats, well, rook would just take on e7. This is lovely. I really like this. So probably it was missed. It was missed during the game. So queen d7, bishop to b5, and it's equal again, bishop to d6, just trying to coordinate the pieces a little bit better. And now we have that move, knight to e5, bishop takes e5, queen takes h5, and just consolidating with the bishop f6 and bishop f4. Right, so obviously here black would want to get one of the rooks to the open file, and then white wants to double up, but black says no thank you. Yeah, knight e5 was quite nice. That was a really cool tactic. Pawn takes and a6. Nice, just chasing the bishop and g6. What's nice about g6? Okay. New topic. Or should I say segue, as some would say. <laughs> Micah, it's 3.30 a.m. Thank you for... Thank you for joining us, Polino. Okay, moving pawns in front of your king. You want to try and avoid this at all costs. But if you have to move a pawn in front of the king, h pawn is okay. Moving the h pawn one up is often considered prophylactic, preventing the bishop from going to the square uh, like g5, g4, or just relieving the king of any back rank threats in the future. Moving the g-pawn is a little bit more risky because here you're creating more than one weakness. As you push the g-pawn, the h6 square here and the f6 square and the g7 square becomes quite weak. If you have a dark squared bishop, it's okay because you can simply drop the bishop back to g7 and it guards all the necessary squares. So g6 here is considered okay. But if you were just recklessly pushing pawns in front of the king, you have to make sure that you have enough pieces to not only guard the king, but also that your king is in no immediate danger. Right? Another nice thing about g6 is that the dark square weaknesses cannot be exploited because the because black has dark square bishop to defend also h6. There's the Greek gift ideas. Nice. G6. Play the tall move, queen takes h7. We're not as brave. We're not that brave. Probably um, Capablanca preferred his endgames to uh, recklessly sacrificing pieces left, right, and center. But also the sacrifice wouldn't make any, any sense, I'm sure. Bilal, what's up, bishop takes g6? I don't know about that. I don't think so. Let's see. White retreats. And bishop g7. Look, that weakness was completely catered for. So the weakness of the g6 were those two squares, but the dark squared bishop was like, well, I will take care of the rest. There's some world champion insights. Wow, eccentric. Wow. You should just join us on this platform. Since it is your, your platform. Alright. So bishop to g7. And bishop to b3. Putting pressure on that d5 pawn. Probably knight e7. Just sorts that out. And e4. I quite like this for white. Nice way to go. Okay, taking the pawn, queen takes, and c6. I really like that do not hurry move. Not in a rush to put any pressure <clears throat> on the center, and also just making sure that everything is solid. And that is what I try to promote while playing chess. Always focus on the three S's. Keep it simple, solid, and satisfying. Aesthetically pleasing. Look at that. Is this an actual game between two GMs? Yes. So it was Capablanca versus Marshall. We are not brave. We play the Petrov. 
Who said that, Peter? Okay, rook to e1 and knight to d5. I like this move. Bishop takes, pawn takes, queen e7. Why did he not exchange? Well, we have to ask ourselves here, does the exchange benefit us? Or does the exchange benefit our opponents? And the answer here is it may in fact benefit our opponents. And why is that? If we take the queen, rook takes, and the general rule is the rook belongs on the seventh rank, because that is where majority of the pawns are. If not, the rook will eventually win a pawn. And here the rook can easily go to a7, attacking a6. It's already putting pressure on f7. And there's no way for black to contest, uh, or at least uh, challenge, this rook for the open file. Probably rook, uh, bishop f6. But that would just be met by rook a7 losing the a6 pawn. I don't see a way to defend it. Alright, so that is why black decided to keep the queens. Oh, Alberto said it. We gotta make sure... Oh, right above that. I did not read it. Oh my goodness. We are not brave. We play the Petrov. Got it. So, Alberto, someone's gonna take that quote. They're gonna frame it and put it um, in their chess hall of fame. In the St. Louis Chess Club. We are not brave. We play the Petrov. <laughs> I like that. Or maybe we can get... Um, Jugo to, to write a song about it. That would be amazing, actually. Exchanging the knight on d5 <clears throat> also didn't seem fine, though. Creating an Isolini. An Isolani. An isolated one. Right, that's true. But the two bishops were pretty strong. So. Rook d8. I think that's losing. Rook d8 runs into queen takes. Queen takes. Uh, rook takes and then rook e8. Bishop f8, bishop h6, and you lose the bishop. You lose the bishop here. That would be very sad. And that's why he decided to play queen c8. Bishop to d6. This seems incredibly overwhelming. What just happened? h6. Interesting. I feel like white had a lot of winning chances here. f6. I'm very confused. Rook e1. Rook d8. And bishop c5. Trying to keep that bishop away from the, the line of the rook. King h7. Queen f7. With the idea of rook e7. Queen f5. Bishop e7. Is it fair to say that this is the best move? Is this not the best move? What's the best move for white here? I'm struggling to find it. The way chess masters can spot these combinations in a split second blows my mind. I believe it's more pattern recognition than anything else. Remember, you're not, you're not born with these um, skills. You acquire them by spending hours and hours in front of a board. It's almost like saying... Um, I cannot believe you remember to blink and often you you don't even think about blinking until well you're thinking about it right now. Um and it's a reflex. You blink because you need to. So you spot these combinations because it's second nature and because you need to over the board, otherwise you will lose. That was probably a very bad analogy, but I'm sticking to it. Who's my favorite chess player? Myself. No I'm joking. Um <laughs> That's a good question. Probably Peter's fiddler. What happened to Kappa? Isn't he just crushing? He really is. It's completely winning here for white. Is this a live game? It's not happening right now. This game is from... 1913. 1913. I don't believe one person here was alive in 1913. As a connoisseur of the scholar's mates... I reject all chess theory. Fair enough, fair enough. I, I too am a connoisseur of, of such quick games. But unfortunately, 
when your opponent is putting a stop to the scholar's mate, that's when you really need to uh, take a, a longer look in the mirror and say, well, is this really worth it? Rookie eight. You are now breathing manually. <laughs> yeah, you've shifted from automatic breathing to manual breathing. And now you have to think about uh, breathing. I was once told that um, everyone is dying. And you have five minutes to live or eight minutes to live. The timer resets every time you take a breath. This is dark, dark. You can also understand my words here within seconds. Someone who just learned to read has to work their way letter by letter, I suppose. Because if you're reading every day, it's second nature. And the more you read, the faster you're able to read at the end of the day. And that's what people want. They want to be good at what they spend their time on. Putting the Petrov in a positive light, of course, but you need to know it from both sides as well. I don't know what you're talking about. So the best move here, oops, is rookie seven, of course. Well, we spoke about rookie seven, and uh, I believe it's just winning after rook g8. What's happening here? <laughs> Maybe we're just playing this move to play bishop f8, aren't we? Unless, of course, we're not, in which case, sadness. Okay. Maybe rook a7. Bishop d6. Okay. I cease to understand chess beyond that. I promise I'm okay at chess. <laughs> so bishop e7 is well with played. Queen to d7, pinning the queen. And rook f8. Queen d6 takes, takes and just pinning some more king and trading and this is just i mean over here capablanca is really good at end games but um after capturing is this not better for white did white not win this what happened oh <gasps> oh no i see what happened oh dear Okay, I see. I see, I see, I see. This reminds me, actually, this is giving me PTSD. It reminds me of a game I played in 2017. It was the fourth round of the tournament, so I was a three out of three, and I was plus 10 in a position. Well, I was playing black, so I was minus 10, and it was very, very similar to this. I, I'm very shocked at how similar it is, and I played the wrong move and we drew. But it was a bishop ending... To be honest, I am tempted to go back and look for that game. I want to see which games I have in my analysis here. It's probably like a whole long list of games I have. This is literally the database I have, but I'm not going to go back and look. Um, but yeah, it was it was a crazy game. F for Kappa. Yep. Hi, Samir. I think C6 because dark bishop true. Probably. If you're talking way... Uh, a long time ago in the game. I don't know. A lot of hard work. Yeah, chess is a lot of hard work. Love your trap explanation. Oh, thank you. Do you think Capablanca is a better endgame player than you? Uh, well, Magnus Carlsen, to be honest with you, I can't answer that. And the reason for that is you've never played against each other. So I don't know. I don't think anyone would be able to answer that question. Yoda would say. Lot of hard work chess is. Yes, Yoda would definitely say it that way. The next game is be between Veselin Topalov and Anant. Anant. 
This game was played in 2003, I believe. Um, I'm not too clued up on when the world championship was or who was world champion in 2003. But I do know this is this is not part of the world championship. It was part of the Vekanzi, Vekanzi uh, tournament in Netherlands. Hi, Khalid. This plays is how intense you are with your approach. To be honest, a lot of uh, what I see on the board is either going to remind me of an experience I've had over the board uh, myself, or it's something new, and I, I really enjoy learning something new. So, yeah. You think it was a Petrov? I know Vichy lost um, a game. East or West? And, oh, you're so sweet, Shivo. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, he blundered his queen, did he not? It was like a... I don't even know if it was a classical event, but he, Vichy blundered his queen. It was astounding. Okay, let's go. e4, e5, knight to f3, knight to f6, knight takes e5, d6. This is all normal. We've gone over this. d4, d5, bishop d3, knight c6. So we've seen all of this. Castles bishop e7, and now we see c4, which is the move eccentric horse was talking about previously, and I think the move that we decided upon in this particular position was indeed knight f6, so the retreating of the knight, and that's exactly what Anand played, h3 and knight to b4, also another move we discussed, the bishop simply goes back to e2, because the value of the bishop is just so great to exchange it for a knight, even though bishops and knights are valued at the same, uh, well, the same points, both three points. Um, they obviously have different powers, and in different positions, they could either be stronger or weaker. In open positions, we prefer our bishops. That's why in the end game, we always aim towards having bishops over knights. And uh, in closed positions, in the middle game, we aim to <laughs> have our knights over bishops. Right. Why there are no players' names when the analysis is happening? Well, I can tell you the names. It's just in the title. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. No, you won't. Um, Veselin Topalov, 2743. Versus Vishyanant, 2753. Hi, good to see you. Welcome to everyone who is just joining us. Fisher thought that a bishop was worth 3.25 pawns compared to 3 pawns for a knight. Though you are right that it depends heavily on the position. Well, eccentric horse has never, never agreed to anything you've said. So that is, that is cool. Thank you so much for agreeing with me. Alrighty, so bishop to e2 and taking on c4. That bishop has wasted so many moves. That bishop has gone to d3, e2, and c4. All in a matter of... In the 11 moves, three of those were owed to the bishop. Castling and knight c3. c6. Exactly the move that we were discussing earlier. Stopping the pawn. And this is how to deal with an IQP. What is an IQP? An IQP is an isolated queen's pawn. And there are several ways to either deal with it. Deal with it as in play with it. Or play against it. Right. So how to play with it. When you have an isolated queen's pawn. Or when you have an isolated pawn. You want to try and avoid exchanges. You want to avoid exchanging pieces. Unless of course it's going to help the isolated queen's pawn become unisolated. For instance if something captures on c3. You'll be happy to take back with the b pawn. Because then those pawns are connected again. And it'll be less of a weakness. Number two, you want to make sure that all your pieces are active. Take advantage of the space that was created by this isolated pawn because the IQP is often in the center. And the center is then being controlled by the person with the IQP. Number three, you want to try and push the IQP as soon as possible because not only will it create uh, problems for your opponent, maybe weaknesses in your opponent's position, but it could also... Um, it's also getting rid of the IQP itself. So you want to try and get rid of that IQP. But in the, in the same sense, you want to use your weakness 
and uh, create weaknesses for your opponent if possible. And now playing against an IQP, of course, that it has its advantages and disadvantages. Number one, you want to try and trade pieces as soon as possible, knight for knight, bishop for bishop, rook for rook, because the more pieces you exchange, the fewer pieces there are to defend a pawn, the pawn, the IQP. The only thing that can protect an IQP are other pieces. No pawns can protect it. So that's why you want to eliminate the pieces. Number two, you want to avoid exchanging where it could improve the IQP. You want to try and prevent that IQP from moving forward and that's why c6 is played here because it covers that d5 square. Number three or four, let's say number three, you want to try and place a blockade in front of that pawn. What is a blockade? A blockade is a piece that you can trust to sit in front of that pawn and stop it from moving forward, also control the squares around it. And the best blockading piece is a knight. That is why knight b4 can easily go to d5 after this. Of course, you don't want to place the knight on d5 where maybe it creates an IQP for yourself. Knight d5, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, queen takes d5, so it's still fine. You don't, you're not forced to take with the c-pawn. So knight d5 is definitely on the table. And uh, number four. I don't even know which number we're on anymore. <laughs> but the last point probably um, is just to to try and keep the pressure there and also have your pieces be as active as possible because um, the IQP has created so much extra space for your opponent. You want to try and keep your pieces just as active as well. You read a book by John Watson, first chapter IQP, didn't understand a thing back then. Hopefully you understand now. Nell, that's very sweet of you to say. I appreciate that. Vladimir Kromnik was the world champion in 2003. Hi, Antonio. Gato. When this game is played. Got it. Don't take my criticisms personally. I'm just trying to help you improve. Have your best interests at heart. Thank you, Eccentric Horse. That's very nice. Chess Master, what's up? I think Magnus says it's 3.15. Listen, I rounded down. I rounded to the nearest whole number, and that is 3. Bought Nimzovich my system on your recommendation. You did, Tom? That's amazing. And uh, if you enjoy these kind of things and need kind of like a, a booster, uh, Chessable is also a great way to go. Chessable uses these books um, and, and tries to make them as interactive as possible. So I quite like that. And uh, yeah, if you start reading Nimzovich as my system, I will pick that book up again and I'll read with you. I will read with you. There is an excellent book about IQP positions. It's called Winning Pawn Structures. I do not know if you have read it. Who's the author? I will take a look. I will take a look. Oh, in an interview, that's amazing. John Watson's book, Secrets of Modern Chess Strategy, advances since Nemzovich. I like it, but maybe you should read Nemzo first. Fair enough. Okay, so that is the whole just of things when it comes to the IQP. Rookie 1. Knight d5, exactly what we were talking about, a blockade, queen to b3, putting extra pressure on that knight, uh, trying to make sure that maybe, best case scenario, the pawn on c6 ends up on d5 too. And the knight just retreats to b6 because he doesn't want to make that kind of commitment. And then bishop to d3, bishop e6, putting pressure on the queen, and then just pushing the pawn on h6 because you didn't, you do not want to make sure, or you don't want to... Um, why to put that kind of pressure on h7 also like i said the prophylaxis point of view um allowing just the king there will be no back rank mate allowing some breathing room for the king and yeah well stopping the bishop from going to g5 even though that's not too much of a problem right now right stumbling over english words english is definitely a difficult language who knew <laughs> rook takes e6 Rook takes e6, and the crowd goes wild. Here we see Veselin Topalov take a stab at this position. I can just imagine Anant in this very position, keeping his cool. 
seeing this rook takes e6 move and just being like, well, now I have to deal with it. Hey, ZZZ, what's up? <laughs> okay, so f takes and queen to e2. Queen to d7 and bishop to d2. Probably just trying to get a lead in development here, bishop d6, knight to e4, and just an exchange. So it was like an intuitive exchange sacrifice. Connoisseur exists also in English. Yep, connoisseur. Is it a French word? <laughs> okay, moving on. So knight to, to d5. I don't know why it's it's getting so dark so early, but I think it's because it's been raining the last couple of days, even though summer is here. Knight takes d6, queen takes d6, and rook to e1. Alrighty, rook d8. Rook d8 is interesting. Why not rook e8? I don't know. So <laughs> then we have a3, rook e8, okay, two central squares there. And I think uh, black will just hold on to the exchange, and that is how it becomes easy for a nunt. Um, to to just hold whoa 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 this move is insane I love it because if pawn takes queen takes e5 so knight retreats knight retreats bishop takes h6 this game is insane I think I just need a, like a moment to take a deep breath here this is crazy Another sack. Another one. This is the third one in the game. Exchange sack video course in Chess 24. Nice. It's French. I'm also fluent in French. Oh, I need to learn French then. When am I going to stream again? Um, I stream uh, most days in the week. Toploff is very strong in his younger years, I can imagine. The younger you are, the more sharp you are, so it makes sense. Eccentric horse is a provoker. Definitely. <laughs> okay, so bishop takes h6. I am shook. Really shook. Knight f4. Okay, question. Why does black not take? And the reason for that is queen g6. And I believe it's just that much better for white. King f8, check. King g8. Oh, wait, you can't take. Wait, wait, wait. The queen is hanging. Wait, wait. <laughs> wow. Wow, I'm so smart. Okay. So check, king. And here, let's see what's going on. Checkmate. This is checkmate. Right. So that's not possible. Takes. Not takes there. Oh my goodness. I'm going to remove that. That didn't happen at all, guys. Takes. Check. Um. Perhaps knight g5 here? How would you proceed? Not like this. Not like this. Rook e5. Wow. Rook e5 for rook g5. Wow. <laughs> do I have a Twitch channel? I do. Um, but you can you can look up my name and my Instagram and everything is there. Everything is there. It's also on my Twitter. Also on my Twitter and on my on my YouTube. Yeah. I'm just going to send a heart into the chat of YouTube. You can check it out there. What opening is the Russian? The Petrov. So as I said previously, the Petrov defense is some, sometimes referred to as the Russian game and is one of the most or more popular games with GMs because it's generally drawish tendencies Many other players prefer to play the Petrov defense so that they can avoid lines in the Riley pairs, the Italian game, and the Scotch game. So it's quite nice. It's possible. Got to go. 
You have a chess lesson? This is a chess lesson. <laughs> okay, let's go back. Knight to f4. Bishop takes, queen takes. Just exchanging pieces, putting pressure on e6. h4, queen h6. So we're going to see how it continues. Oh, <gasps> okay. Wow. That pawn got far in life. Doubling up. Knight g5. And now it's just that much better for black. Anant is doing an excellent job. Excellent, excellent job. Never mind the discovered check. Rook to e4. Check. 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 That king definitely gets away with it. I like this. Oh, wow. Okay. Look at it go. I love these. Whenever you want to learn an opening, Google it. Literally, Google if you want to learn the Scotch game. The Scotch game, chess games. The Scotch game, chess games. That's it. And Rook, C3. And it's over. Completely over. Indian in their names. What does the King's Indian have? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I wish I had all the knowledge of Wikipedia. I'd be able to answer all of your questions. What chess book would you recommend for someone who is 1300? Aaron Emzovich, my system. Always a go-to. Always a go-to. Or even just watching YouTube videos um, such as this one or other Chess24 YouTube videos. But I'm pretty sure it's more of a preference. So if there's someone you enjoy watching, then you'll go and you'll check out their particular videos. And maybe they're entertaining. Maybe they're funny. Maybe they're interesting. Maybe you like their voice. So it's just a matter of preference. Yes. Okay. I would have loved to, to take a look at Elijah Williams versus Howard Staunton. And, um, but if we just go back for a second to something like this, how to, to play it with white is just to, to keep a, keep an eye out for that Staunton. It wasn't. Stafford, Stafford Gambit. I'm going to Google it quickly. Stafford Gambit Chess. Okay, understanding the Stafford Gambit. The Stafford Gambit begins in the Petrov opening. Okay. Alrighty, this is what I like to see. This opening can be tricky to deal with if white is unprepared. Black gives up a chance to equalize early in the hopes that white plays a natural move in this position. d3, knight c3, bishop c4, which leads to one of many traps. At the highest levels, this is considered a dubious opening, since this gambit's success stems from the opponent's knowledge of the theory and the traps in the position. Interesting. It should likely be played at the submaster level in shorter time controls, blitz, bullet, etc. So what I was referring to here is this. And then after exchanges, there was like a bunch of arrows suggested. Um, the main trap. What is the main trap? Ah. Okay, so the main trap looks like this. Uh, is it bishop c4 first? What does it look like? No, it isn't. Okay. So d3, bishop to c5, and bishop to g5. Completely winning for black. And the reason for that is knight takes e4, bishop takes d8, bishop takes f2. I'm pretty sure this is why Eric Rosen this really likes this opening. And bishop to g4, completely winning. This is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> and this is why you need to play h3. d3, h3. Just play d3, h3, you're done. Like, you don't have to deal with anything anymore. 
And th that took me a while to research as well. It's like this, this opening is so silly. Why do I need to analyze it? Then I analyzed it and realized there was one move to stop it all. Winner takes it all. <laughs> this was a lot of fun, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I hope you learned something. I really, really hope that. I know it was all over the place, but I too was learning. I was learning with you. We were learning together. This is almost like a, a kind of study group that we have going. I answer your questions. We discuss some things. Um, I learn from you. Believe it or not, your comments help me too. And uh, it's always such a pleasure being here. So I will see you guys again. Uh, this will be the last... Oh my goodness, it's the last lecture for the World Online Schools Chess Tournament because it's beginning really soon. I think it begins today or in a few days. Um, but yeah, there'll be a number of master classes coming up. So if you go to cochess.com, you can learn more about me. You can learn more about the people I work with. And uh, I'm very excited for the new projects to come. So I'll see you guys really, really soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>